1944, the end of the war in France. The Nazis were on the run. Paris was set free. Parisian joy turned swiftly to revenge. Hundreds of women were punished for having relationships with German soldiers. And thousands of men were executed without trial for aiding the Nazis. But this very public display of cleansing did little to sanitize a much deeper guilt. Because millions of ordinary French people had worked alongside the Nazis, the collaboration went right to the top. France's leaders had joined with the Nazis to persecute its people and rid the country of its Jews. No man epitomized French collaboration more than Pierre Laval. His activities during the Second World War still divide the French today. As Prime Minister during German occupation, it was Laval who had to deal with the brutal Third Reich. By working with Hitler, was he sheltering his people, or was he a willing collaborator actively helping the Nazis? The decisions taken by Laval would see him become one of the most detested men in French history. But was the label deserved? Just how guilty is Pierre Laval? Pierre Laval grew up at the height of the Belle Epoque. It was France's beautiful era. It was 1910, an age of affluence, mass development, and overconsumption. But France was a nation divided, divided by class and wealth. To the working classes, the good times meant grinding poverty. Pierre Laval made his name as a lawyer defending the rights of ordinary working men. He described himself. A comrade among comrades, a worker among workers. In 1913, Laval proudly affirmed his left-wing beliefs and won election to the French legislature. It marked the beginning of his political career but also the end of the good times for his beloved France. The outbreak of World War I in 1914 saw Germany invade Belgium and Luxembourg and then storm into France. Over eight million French were mobilized. But Laval was fiercely anti-war, a pacifist. He refused to join the army, and it almost led to his arrest. British and French forces held the German offensive along the Western Front, but at a huge cost. When the guns fell silent on the 11th of November, 1918, 1.7 million French were dead and over 4 million injured. The country's infrastructure was in ruins and they owed millions to their allies. The war claimed the life of Laval's only brother, Jean. The conflict deeply affected Laval. So as the world's powers met in Versailles to devise the post-war order, Laval was determined never to allow France to suffer the horror of war again. He believed that only politics held the key to peace in Europe. In 1924, he became a government minister. So began Laval's ascent up the greasy pole of French politics. It was a climb that saw him become undersecretary to the premier, minister of justice twice, and minister of labor. But Europe was descending into yet another dark period in its history.
1929, stock markets and banks in New York crashed spectacularly. The crisis spread like cancer throughout the world. The subsequent Great Depression hit industrial nations like Britain, Germany and America particularly hard. In Germany, the economy crumpled, unemployment soared and the government collapsed. The Nazi party seized control with Adolf Hitler as its leader. And in 1933, Hitler became chancellor and leader of Germany. Deve cristallizzare una posizione di potente giustizia. By now in Italy, Benito Mussolini, the son of a blacksmith, had seized power in a coup. He'd also declared himself dictator and turned Italy into a police state. More than 300,000 people gathered in the Piazza del Plebiscito. There's only one man in Italy who can collect a throng like that. Yep, you've guessed it. Mussolini himself, Il Duce, the chief. While these two great dictators rose to power in Germany and Italy, France turned to Pierre Laval. On the 27th of January, 1931, he reached his zenith and became prime minister. His was a liberal government appointing Blaise Dien of Senegal to his cabinet, the first black African in a French government. Under Laval, France weathered the world economic storm and became the richest country in Europe. Unemployment was relatively low, and it had vast gold reserves. Laval used that wealth as a means to diplomatic ends. He wooed President Hoover and America with his Gallic charm, and the Americans were smitten. He was named Time Magazine's Man of the Year for 1931 and mingled with America's finest. Laval returned to France a world statesman. He now had the credibility and authority to pursue his passion, to forge a lasting peace in Europe. The greatest threat to that peace was Germany, where Hitler was building a massive army and air force. So Laval decided to build an anti-German coalition. In 1935, he traveled to Moscow and signed an anti-German deal with Stalin. Then Laval flew to Italy to try and prize Mussolini from his alliance with Hitler. Diplomatic overtures between France and Italy have paved the way for the visit to Rome of Monsieur Laval, French foreign minister. Inside his palace, Signor Mussolini signs a pact which settles some outstanding differences which have marred the friendship between Italy and France. Monsieur Laval now signs the documents on behalf of his country. The Stresa Front was a peace treaty between France, Britain and Italy, a united front against German aggression. But that unity would not last for long. L'opinione era rimasta indietro! Mussolini's ambition was to create a new Roman Empire. He'd built a massive military machine comprising one of the largest navies in the world. It made Italy and Mussolini a force to be reckoned with. And on October the 3rd, 1935, he decided to test its strength. His grand plan began with the invasion of Abyssinia, modern-day Ethiopia.
Abyssinia was a free, sovereign, independent nation, and this act of aggression by Mussolini caused international outrage. He wanted more colonists, and he flung his picturesque robber band into battle against almost defenseless Abyssinia. The memories of the use of poison gas and the bombing of a simple people with no planes or anti-aircraft weapons, these memories are still fresh today. The world looked to France and Britain to uphold the rule of law and deal with Mussolini. Laval, the former pacifist, was desperate to avoid war at any cost. So he and British Foreign Secretary Samuel Hoare secretly put forward a plan to carve up Abyssinia and allow Italy to stay. In return, Mussolini agreed to honor the Strasser Front deal and oppose German aggression. But the so-called Hoare-Laval Pact was leaked to the press. The British and French public were disgusted that their leaders had failed to stop Mussolini's aggression. The pact fell apart. Laval lost his job and would forever bear a grudge. He's very disappointed with the way that the um, Hoare-Laval Pact turns out. And this instills in Laval a sense of disillusion with the British. And this helps encourage in him an idea that the British can't really be trusted. In time, Laval would find more reasons to dislike the British. For now, he returned to the back benches, where he formed a lasting alliance with a First World War hero, Marshal Philippe Pétain. But more significant events were about to unfold that would eventually see Laval return to power and ultimately lead him to the firing squad. On September the 1st, 1939, Hitler's tanks stormed into Poland. France and Britain united to declare war on Germany. All Laval's attempts to keep the peace had come to nothing. He was horrified, telling a friend, It has begun. There will be millions of corpses. On the 10th of May, 1940, the German army launched their blitzkrieg, invading Holland, Belgium, and Luxembourg. And five days later, it was France's turn. The Germans smashed their way across the border. The speed of their assault was overwhelming. They cut a deep scar into northeastern France and headed for Paris. Thousands of French surrendered in their wake. French Prime Minister Paul Renault telephoned Winston Churchill. I woke him up. I told him, we have lost the battle. We are beaten. But Churchill seemed so astonished that I had to repeat, we are beaten, we have lost the battle. Impossible, he said. On the 14th of June, 1940, German forces entered Paris. At 10 p.m. that night, President Renault resigned. His replacement was Pierre Laval's ally, 84-year-old Marshal Philippe Pétain. Pétain was loved in France as a war hero, but even this experienced warrior could see that the French had no choice. Surrender or face annihilation. The game was up. Pétain told the French to lay down their arms. But not all Frenchmen agreed. Brigadier General Charles de Gaulle, Under Secretary for War and a tank commander, refused to surrender. Along with other senior military officers, he fled to Britain, from where he addressed his nation. L'honneur, le bon sens, l'intérêt supérieur de la patrie, Commande à tous les Français libres de continuer le combat, 
là où ils seront et comme ils pourront. Vive la France, libre, dans l'honneur et dans l'indépendance. But there was little response. For millions of French people, running to the hills and joining the resistance just wasn't an option. They had families and responsibilities. They had farms to run and businesses to maintain. So despite de Gaulle's call to arms, most French people accepted their fate. Four days later, Marshal Patin agreed to Hitler's terms of surrender. France was split in two. Germany would control the north, while Patin would govern the south of the country from the small town of Vichy. The surrender was signed at Compiègne, northeast of Paris. The meeting was even held in the same railway carriage used by the Allies to accept the German surrender in 1918. For France, the humiliation was complete. Hitler was ecstatic. News of the surrender was broadcast by loudspeaker cars to a devastated French people. Devra rejoindre des forces à désigner et sera démobilisé et désarmé sous contrôle allemand, respectivement italien. On the 11th of July, 1940, Marshal Pétain appointed Pierre Laval as his prime minister. Laval's return to the cabinet was under very different conditions than before. This time, he would have to work with the Nazis. Millions of people were now looking to him to protect and defend them, and he would soon learn what collaboration would mean. A large part of the French Navy was moored off Mers al Kabir in Algeria. Fearful that Hitler would get his hands on it, Winston Churchill demanded Laval hand it over or have it destroyed. Laval refused. So Churchill sent a task force led by the biggest battle cruiser in the world, HMS Hood. When it reached Mers al Kabir, Churchill gave orders to sink the French fleet. Thirteen hundred French sailors were killed. Laval was outraged with Churchill and demanded a counterattack against his former ally, the British. Pétain refused, but Hitler was impressed. Laval had passed his first test. Very soon, Hitler would ask Laval for even more. As autumn of 1940 approached, Hitler was planning the invasion of Britain Pétain and Laval were summoned by the Führer. Der französische Regierungschef Marshal Pétain trifft ein und wird mit militärischen Ehren empfangen.
In a key meeting in the town of Montoire, Hitler asked Pétain to join him and declare war on Britain. Pétain again refused, but agreed to an historic compromise. He revealed the outcome of the meeting to the French people. I responded freely to the Führer's invitation. I underwent no diktat, no pressure from him. A collaboration was envisioned between our two countries. I accepted the principle. The details will be discussed later. At the time, collaboration did not seem to be such a dirty word. Millions of French people were already sharing their lives with the Nazis. Collaborating was seen as normal. For instance, the famous French designer Coco Chanel conducted a long affair with a German officer who installed her in his suite in the Ritz Hotel. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. And world-famous entertainer Maurice Chevalier would soon be singing to German soldiers in Berlin. All right, thank you, boys. Even Jean Borotra, the legendary Wimbledon tennis champion, became a collaborator. He became Vichy's Minister of Sport, though he always claimed he and Pétain were true French patriots. It was a thing which uh, almost all the Frenchmen uh, wanted very badly, that, uh, to see the Germans going out. <laughs> and uh, of course, he knew that it was going to be a long proce process, and he could say nothing about it. He never said that to anybody, I think. <laughs> but uh, he uh, had to manage uh, at that time uh, to see to it that France, France could leave until that happened. Until then, the people of Vichy France would have to coexist with the Germans. Hitler did allow Pétain to keep his own Vichy police force. Soldier Jacques Delroux was one of those who collaborated by signing up. Mais je ne pensais pas du tout quand je suis rentré à la police, c'était pour arriver à quitter l'armée, mais je ne pensais pas du tout y faire une carrière. Et puis j'ai découvert que c'était un métier qui pouvait être tout à fait passionnant. Marshal Pétain's view of collaboration was that he should do as little as possible to help Hitler. Alors, ce que je peux dire, c'est que parmi mes collègues, beaucoup admiraient le maréchal Pétain. Mais tout c'était extrêmement anti-allemand, à part, bien évidemment, il y a toujours des exceptions. One of those exceptions was Pierre Laval. At the end of November 1940, he signed over 220 tons of French gold to the Nazis. Laval had pleased Hitler again, but Pétain was furious, and Laval was sacked. Laval went home to his family and local Parisian politics, but he'd already become a hated figure. Laval was shot twice by a would-be assassin, The gunman was sentenced to death, but Laval spared him. During his recovery, Pétain suggested he return to government, and even Hitler intervened to speed the comeback of a trusted collaborator. But how things had changed. When Laval left government in 1940, the Second World War was essentially a European conflict. Now it had assumed global proportions. The Germans had invaded the Soviet Union, but their advance had been halted by fierce fighting. In the east, Japan had attacked the US naval base at Pearl Harbor. In support of his Japanese allies, Hitler had declared war on the USA. The might of the American military machine had now been unleashed on Germany. Hitler simply could not compete. 
he was fighting a war on many fronts and was struggling to keep pace. The war was going badly. In Russia, the German army was bogged down on the outskirts of Stalingrad. In the air, the British and now American planes were bombing German cities. Hitler was running short of tanks, guns, ammunition, and most importantly, men. Production of weapons and equipment was at full capacity and German workers were stretched to the limit. Pierre Laval could have used the situation to renegotiate the terms of the collaboration with Germany. But instead, he decided to reaffirm his desire to work with the Nazis, stating, No threat will prevent me from pursuing agreement and reconciliation with Germany, because this policy is prompted solely by concern for France. Hitler asked Laval to follow those words with action. He demanded a quarter of a million skilled French workers be sent to Germany to help the war effort. How could Laval appease Hitler and protect his people? Was this a collaboration too far? Laval negotiated with Hitler and won a compromise. One French prisoner of war would be returned to France in exchange for three workers sent to Germany. La Relève, or exchange, got underway immediately. The first few thousand POWs were released from German camps and loaded onto trains heading back to France. To the returning POWs, Laval was a hero. He personally welcomed home the first train load at Compiègne. As the POWs disembarked, they swapped places with French workers who then left for the foundries of Germany's industrial heartland, the Ruhr. But this rare French triumph was tarnished when Laval justified the scheme in a newspaper article. I hope for German victory, because without it, Bolshevism will install itself everywhere tomorrow. That hope for a German victory would return to haunt him. Until now, Laval's collaboration with Hitler had concerned materials, goods, and workers. But now, Hitler asked him for blood. For years, the Nazis had rounded up Jews from all over Europe and interned them awaiting the answer to what they called the Jewish question. By January 1942, they had their answer. Death camps were built in Poland. Jews from all over Europe would be transferred to the camps and liquidated. At the start of the occupation of France, a commission for Jewish questions had been set up, and there was no shortage of Frenchmen willing to help the Nazis answer those questions. Je pense que il n'y a pas une très grande différence entre la France et l'Angleterre, et encore moins avec l'Amérique à ce sujet-là. Mon idée, c'était qu'il fallait surtout éliminer l'influence juive de secteurs où ils étaient extrêmement influents, où ils pesaient sur l'opinion publique. Anti-Semitism laws had also been repealed. Sans français de vieilles souches françaises, 90 au moins sont de vrais blancs, purs de tout autre mélange racial. Il n'en est pas de même des juifs. Celui-ci est issu de métissage accompli il y a déjà plusieurs millénaires 
entre des Ariens, des Mongols et des Nègres. Le Juif a donc un visage, un corps, des attitudes, des gestes. Thousands of Jews, gypsies and communists in occupied France had been sent to internment camps, including the biggest here at Drancy, near Paris. All this happened while Pierre Laval was in his political wilderness. But just after Laval's return to office in July 1942, one of the most infamous roundups took place in Paris. During Operation Spring Breeze, 13,000 foreign-born Jews, men, women, and children, were arrested. Any childless couples were taken straight to the Drancy camp. But families were kept at the Winter Velodrome in terrible conditions and then deported to the Auschwitz death camp. This all took place in German-occupied France. It had nothing to do with Laval. But it is now known that the Vichy government shed no tears over the fate of the foreign Jews in France, who were seen as a nuisance. Laval even called them the dregs. The effect of the roundup was to drive hundreds into the arms of the French resistance. In the countryside, they were called the Mackie. Up in the High Savoy, in the Pyrenees and in other mountain districts, the reborn France is being nurtured to lusty manhood by the Maquis, those bands of young men who, in the words of de Gaulle, do not accept defeat. Organized sabotage has reached proportions highly alarming to the enemy. One of the most recent triumphs of the Maquis was the blowing up at Grenoble of a German barracks, killing 500 Nazis, wounding many more. Late in 1942, the resistance staged a bombing campaign against German targets in the city of Marseille. Many Nazis were wounded or killed. They're worried about Marseille as a city. Marseille has a really bad reputation. It's a city which is associated with gangsterism in the 1930s, with the black market. And so the Germans are worried that this is going to be a city that's going to be a, a difficult area to police. Hitler called Marseille the cancer of Europe and sent in the SS. But fearing a bloodbath, Pierre Laval convinced Hitler to let his own police force run the operation. À Marseille, nous tombons dans cette énorme concentration de forces de, de police de toute la zone libre. On avait amené plus de 1000 inspecteurs de police, 10, 12000 gardiens de la paix, gardes mobiles, gendarmes, etc. They say to the Germans, we will carry out raids across the city, identity checks. We will uh, go into people's houses and see that they're in order, see that they're not prostitutes, they're not Jews, etc. And we'll do this across the city. But it wasn't enough for the SS, who insisted the old port be demolished. They're worried about these narrow streets in the old parts of Marseille, around the, the Vieux-Port, Le Panier district, as it's called. They're worried about the fact that this could be a place where resistors hang out. On the 16th of January, 1943, the assault on Marseille began. Les, les, les sapeurs, les, les, les gens de, de, des mines de l'armée allemande ont fait sauter les immeubles un par un sans la moindre précaution. Ils mettaient le maximum de charge pour que ça aille vite. Fourteen hundred buildings were destroyed. And although the operation was intended to root out terrorists, sixteen hundred, mostly foreign Jews, were taken to Dorsey. It was the French police who loaded the Jews onto the trains. Et c'était un spectacle épouvantable, vous savez. Et puis on a vu on a arrivé tous ces gens évacués du vieux port avec des paquets, des, des baluchons, des valises, des enfants, enfin des, des, des matelas roulés pour certains. Enfin, 
Et, et ces gens-là, on les a aidés à monter dans ces wagons. Nous sommes montés avec eux, un, un, un gardien par wagon. Mais on disait qu il, qu il, qu on les, que les Allemands les envoyaient travailler euh, à l'Est, enfin, etc. Euh, la réalité des camps de concentration tels qu'ils ont, ont d'extermination, euh, on l'a découverte qu'à qu la fin de la guerre, qu'après la guerre, qu la, après l'occupation, disons. Once again, Laval had calculated that doing the Nazis' bidding was the best policy for protecting Vichy France. But across the Mediterranean Sea, the war in North Africa was about to wreck his delicate plan. The German army was reeling from the effects of the British assault at El Alamein. Then Allied forces led by the Americans attacked the Germans from the west. The German army beat a hasty retreat. Hitler's southwestern flank was now exposed to the American forces. He couldn't risk an Allied invasion of France via Vichy. He had no choice but to take over Vichy and occupy the whole of France. The invasion took just two days. On the 19th of November, all of France was under Hitler's control. He summoned Pierre Laval and demanded more workers for Germany, yet another quarter of a million. Laval stalled again, but he had to make a key concession promising to deal with the French resistance once and for all. Ici Londres. Veuillez écouter tout d'abord quelques messages personnels. The resistance, aided by British intelligence, was growing in strength and numbers. Encouraged, enthused and equipped by General Charles de Gaulle and his free French army in London, it was becoming a ruthless guerrilla army. They sabotaged railway lines, they ambushed German troops and assassinated officers. Hitler demanded action. He ordered Laval to create a new pro-German force called the Milice. It marked a turning point for Laval. By June 1943, the Milice had signed up over 30,000 men. They conducted summary executions, assassinations, and helped capture Jews and other enemies of the Reich for deportation. Until this point, Laval could argue he had balanced Berlin's demands with the welfare of the French. But with the formation of the Milice, he had crossed the line he became an active persecutor of his own people. The Melis quickly expanded operations committing terrible crimes. La milice a constitué des, des cours martiales, des tribunaux d'exception qui ont siégé dans les prisons, un peu partout en France. Moi, je les ai entendus donc, dans la prison de Limoges et la, la première, les gens qui venaient d'être condamnés, quand on les a emmenés dans le chemin de ronde pour être fusillés, ils ont tous chanté la Marseillaise. Et la Marseillaise, je l'entendais d'une oreille distraite, comme tout le monde, mais je ne l'ai plus jamais entendu de la même façon. Just as Laval was losing his grip on law and order, Germany was losing its grip on Europe. Its army was in full retreat. Stalin's Red Army had driven them out of the Soviet Union and had retaken Poland. The Allied armies had landed in Italy and liberated Rome. 
and Berlin was being bombed around the clock. The people of Berlin, like those of so many other German cities, are now getting the full taste of the war they themselves so callously loosed on the world. Losses on the Eastern Front were huge. Hitler was getting desperate and demanded Laval send him more French workers to rebuild his broken army. Again, Laval stalled, but soon matters were taken from his hands. On the 6th of June 1944, the Allies landed in northern France. D-Day was the beginning of the end for the Third Reich. But rather than join the Allied troops in fighting the Germans, Laval told his countrymen, You are not in the war. You must not take part in the fighting. If you do not observe this rule, if you show proof of indiscipline, you will provoke reprisals, the harshness of which the government would be powerless to moderate. You would suffer both physically and materially. At this moment, fraught with drama, when the war has been carried on to our territory, show by your worthy and disciplined attitude that you are thinking of France and only of her. But no one in France was listening to him. Towns and villages all over northern France were liberated, one by one. With American forces on the outskirts of Paris, Laval, Pétain, and the detested Melisse were taken to Germany and kept at the castle at Sigmaringen on the banks of the Danube. In Paris, the resistance seized their chance. They grabbed what weapons they could and fought the Germans in the streets. As the Nazis flee for the Reich, they suffer at the hands of French patriots. The German crew leaps from the frying pan into the fire. They were even joined by some of Laval's Vichy police. Contrairement à ce que beaucoup de gens pensent, beaucoup de policiers ont été résistants. Et il y a beaucoup de, de, de policiers qui ont rendu des services en faisant des fausses cartes d'identité. Ça a été mon cas. Hein? Mais c'était des, des petites choses, même si on sauvait une vie humaine, au milieu de ce, cette énorme... Euh, tragédie, c'était des, des grains de sable. Mais bon, c'était si on sauve une vie, on sauve une vie. Hein. On the 19th of August, 1944, Paris was liberated. General Charles de Gaulle, leader of the Free French, returned in triumph. Libéré par son peuple avec le concours. Les armées de la France avec l'appui et le concours de la France tout entière, c'est-à-dire de la France qui se bat, c'est-à-dire de la seule France, de la vraie France, de la France éternelle. The Allied army now pushed on towards Germany, and in April 1945, they reached Sigmaringen. The net was closing in on Pierre Laval, and he fled to Spain. Meanwhile, Charles de Gaulle was installed as president of a provisional government and negotiated an extradition order to return Laval to Paris. Laval was arrested and charged with plotting against the security of the state. 
and of collaborating with the enemy. He was locked up, awaiting trial. The rest of France descended into recrimination and reprisal. Nazi collaborators were humiliated, beaten, and murdered. Ironically, many ended up in the Drancy camp, waiting for a trial rather than a death train. News from France includes this eminently satisfactory picture from Drancy near Paris. Once a concentration camp for Jews during the German occupation, it is now full of collaborationists. Pierre Laval would soon have his day in court. But first he was called as a witness in the trial of Marshal Patin. Mais un témoin nouveau va pouvoir être entendu, une vraie vedette cette fois, rien moins que Pierre Laval. Despite Laval's unwavering support for Patin, the former president was convicted of treason and sentenced to death. De Gaulle commuted the sentence, and he lived out the rest of his days on an island off the Atlantic coast. Now it was Laval's turn. His trial began on the 11th of October, 1945. Laval, the skilled negotiator and talented barrister, knew that his defense was futile. Laval's legal team had never met him, and before long they asked to be relieved. The trial descended into chaos, with constant outbursts from the jury and arguments between the prosecutors and Laval. Eventually, Laval decided to remain silent and then to be tried in absentia. 33 witnesses were called, but only four appeared, none for the defense. The key piece of evidence against him was the newspaper article from the 22nd of June, 1942, where Laval had called for a German victory. He was sentenced to death. At sunrise, a firing squad files into the prison where Laval is held. An empty hearse arrives. In the enclosed courtyard of the prison, Laval is led to face his executioners. Laval was tied to a stake. He asked permission to give the order to fire himself, but was refused. From the prison came cries of Vive Laval, long live Laval. Laval himself cried, Vive la France. A traitor is dead. Pierre Laval now lies in an unhonored cemetery with his fellow criminals against mankind. But was Pierre Laval a criminal against mankind? At his trial, Laval had asked to be judged not by his words, but by his deeds. In his defense, Laval was a negotiator and a compromiser, whose skill with words was his only weapon in a deadly game with the Nazis. And he'd been dealt a poor hand. His country had been defeated and occupied. Someone had to face the Nazis across the negotiating table. Laval was that person. Sacrifices and compromises were inevitable. He would claim that he had won the return of thousands of prisoners of war, albeit at a cost. And he had repeatedly and successfully fended off Hitler's demands for more workers. But against this, he did little to save thousands of foreign Jews who were deported to the death camps and exterminated. And when he set up the milice, he knew he'd created a monster that would run rampant through the country, murdering his own people. It was by these actions that Pierre Laval stands condemned to this day.